we don't build anything more complicated than a nuclear submarine. And when you put ballistic missiles on it, think about it, something that can shoot a missile over 4,000 miles away from anywhere in the ocean and actually hit a target and be able to do that on a 24-7 basis while the submarine lives in a very unfriendly environment and the sea is very unfriendly, um, that's a pretty amazing thing. Plus, people got to live on it, they got to be able to get shot at, they got to be quiet, um, and they do that for 75, 80 days. We just had the, um, one of our submarines go through a 140-day patrol with one break in the middle. Pretty exceptional platform. So all the way from the beginning of an idea of, you know, I think I want a submarine out there, to delivering it, you have the whole gamut of thinking through what is it supposed to do, um, kind of what do I know, what's the art of the possible that I can uh, have it do, and then how would I develop solutions that meet that capability. If you want to be able to shoot a torpedo or, or conduct some surveillance mission or I need to deal with a potential threat um, submarine, you have to think through the entire spectrum. And what the acquisition business done is, does is all the way from the concepts to design and the details to the fielding, constructing and essentially the testing and certifying and then part of my enterprise is sustaining that. My program executive officer for submarine organization is about an eight billion dollar a year business. Um, we buy two Virginia class submarines a year. We're designing the next fleet ballistic missile submarine um, and that that is um, something that uh, is a very difficult set of um, problems. You have a boundary condition on cost, you have a boundary condition on time, you have a boundary condition on um, the technical achievability of some of the things you want to put into that submarine. The engineering habits of mind help you kind of sort through the way you should approach a problem and also not exercise what I call physics-free thinking, which is, unfortunately is a malaise I see in our country, in that you can help develop solutions that you kind of know, are they practically, are they physically possible, and also is it something that makes sense. And I think that uh, engineering education, without it, you would have a hard time having the judgment to decide whether what you're being told or what you're trying to think through even makes sense. Could you even do it? Having an engineering kind of view of how things work, along with some business that comes in um, with experience, it helps you understand um, you can at least even if you don't know the details of the technical issue in front of you it helps you understand how you can get into hitting the key points and understand the key parameters so that you can eventually make that key decision that uh, hopefully gets the program um, on the right course. What I see uh, coming out of the, of the um, institutions and the civilian workforce that I have now the younger folks you end up with folks who are very good at their discipline that they're educated in. Good electrical engineer, good mechanical engineer. Um, the problem is eventually things that are pieces have to work as a sum in a system. And the lack of ability for people to think in a system approach to problems is something that we run up against every single day. Um, something as simple as trying to figure out how to put a battery in a submarine. We use that as essentially a way to provide power if in fact the nuclear propulsion plant goes offline. Well, integrating that battery into the confines of a ship and then dealing with how do you cool it, how does it operate, how does it work electrically, how does it work physically, um, that's a pretty hard system engineering problem. And it takes a person who can actually think systemically, not just component-wise, to do that. And that's probably something that our engineering workforce needs to continue to get better at when they come out of the schools, is the system engineering they need to write. I didn't spend much time thinking about writing. I eschewed English and history. What do I spend most of the time now? Working on writing things and learning about history. I think people who can uh, write, they're invaluable. And being able to communicate whatever it is you're trying to do, whether it's a presentation or a paper, prose is a, is a skill that we're losing because of our uh, text environment that we live in an email. But being able to put something together cogently for an engineer to frame their thoughts present it to somebody who maybe doesn't know the detail and get their point across, that's a skill. And to do it simply is even a better skill. Uh, I was able to go to Korea and uh, visit uh, Daewoo DSME and also look at uh, DSEC, which is their engineering arm for their Korean shipbuilding industry. And the, the reason I went there was to look at how the Koreans design 
and deliver essentially commercial ships and how can they do it so effectively and quickly. Um, in Korea, my numbers might, might not be 100% accurate, but they're close enough. For naval architects, marine engineers, they produce 3,000 of them a year. Now I'm a little close to the naval architecture aspect, especially the submarine naval arts. That's probably on the order of at least 10 times what the U.S. puts out. Our whole country. Um, we only have a few, I can name the Webbs, the Michigans, the MITs, the um, Virginia Tech. There's very few schools that actually produce naval architects. And when you look at um, the need, naval architects by their very nature are system engineers. They put together the platform with all the other disciplines. We are lacking, I think, in our ability to put out engineers writ large in this country. And especially engineers that are um, mechanical engineering. I was happy to see when I was at MIT it was actually a growing skill. But we're still behind. And I think part of it is because of the perception. I have three daughters. I'm 0 for 3 in engineers. And the reason is because engineering is looked at as a boring, staid profession. And I don't, I don't think we do a good enough job of showing these kids what a diff, difference you can make and also um, that it is really exciting and important work. MIT had, um, I, I saw one project that caught my attention and one was, it was in uh, South America. They were trying to figure out how in the, and it may have been um, in Chile, but they were trying to figure out how to get water to the high altitudes yet you have this fog that comes in every day. So mechanical engineers develop basically a net that would precipitate out the fog and then pour in and you get water, which would then help the agricultural solutions. I mean, you want to talk about helping people? Right there, an engineer helps people. And I think the world of non-kinetics is going to grow. Our ability to shoot things like lasers, um, and electronic warfare and delivering effects without having to use a missile or a gun, um, or a torpedo are going to continue to grow. And I think that's, uh, you see if you look at the Ponce, it's out there with a laser that the Office of Naval Research developed. Uh, very exciting. Some video you have online of it shooting down an unmanned aircraft vehicle. Well, you, can you do that from a submarine? Uh, can a submarine go and influence the shore networks? I mean, all this kind of things that I think will actually open the portfolio of capability that Navy can provide. One of the things the Navy is, is it's everywhere. You know, we're in every fleet, every part of the world 24-7. So that brings a capability of presence, and then what do you do with that presence? Um, I think we're going to continue to push the ability to deliver more and more capable ships and platforms and systems for less money. How can we break this getting more complicated, centering more in a multi-mission diverse platform, which eventually I can, eventually I can buy one of them for the entire Navy for a year. Um, we have to be able to distribute that capability and do it affordably. We have to have people who understand the basic fundamental principles so that they can actually make decisions. Because in the end, what's your product? You've got to be able to make decisions and you may have to exercise judgment. It's hard to do either of those if you're illiterate, whatever the subject is. Technically illiterate, that's a national security issue for us. We have to have a technically literate society. One is they'll value the technically literate graduate and an engineering student will be valued. In Korea, the shipbuilding people, they are valued. They're like rock stars. You come here and you say you're a naval architect in the US, you're like, so what? Well, that's boring. But in Korea, it's a national pride. Where's our national pride in our engineering base? I think it's missing. The Navy needs good engineers, and we need, uh, and we need them in numbers. Um, the, I see looking forward, I'm in the acquisition business, you know, I look 10, 20, 30 years in the future, the problems are not going to get easier. As a matter of fact, they're going to get a lot harder. Interdisciplinary, system, but an expert in the field that you understand. And, I, and as time goes on, um, I think people, also our engineers, when I was an engineer, like I said, I never read history. I can remember my history people professor saying, you know, you guys are young, this is when you should be questioning and thinking. I'm like, I just want to get done with this dang non-engineering course and get on to my next important calculus or engineering class. Wrong decision because um, you want broad people too who can think about how what they're doing fits kind of in the, in the role of life.